Few black American comedic entertainers have flourished and stood the test of time in Hollywood. Martin Lawrence is one of them. With a career spanning more than three decades, he's a triple threat. Flavor Flav, look at him. Pioneering stand-up comic. Flav so ugly, roaches do like this. Daddy! <laughs> Network sitcom star. I think the case should be thrown out due to the fact that I'm insane. An executive producer. Do the pocket knife. Do the pocket knife. Who has starred in a string of blockbuster films since the late 80s. <laughs> you made me think you were going to shoot me for a minute. I was. Life. What the hell you mean? Like, what hell no, I ain't doing no life. I'm going back to myself. Of course, it's always good to have a backup plan. One last time. One last time. <laughs> Lawrence led the way for countless up-and-coming comedians everywhere. Yo, give it up for Tracy Morgan. As the first host of HBO's trailblazing deaf comedy jam. I told you I didn't want to come. I didn't know anything about the deaf jam. To this day, his style of storytelling and stomping on stage emulated by comics over the years. We sat down with Martin Lawrence, pioneer, mentor, and all-around funny guy. When you think about your career, mm. you know, 30, 35 years now, mm. and all of the brilliance that came through, do you see yourself as that person? I've always wanted to see myself as a person uh, to be able to get into a uh, position to be able to help people and uh, showcase my comedy and uh, be able to introduce people through my work and, and give them jobs and things like that that are qualified. What did the comedy industry, particularly stand-up, look like before, let's say, you got to do the right thing? Uh, what did it look like? Well, I was boxing before, right. before uh, <laughs> stand-up, so, you know, I, I was the next Sugar Ray Leonard. <laughs> you too? I, I think I, yeah, yeah, I was, I was the next year to make a Tommy Hearns or whatever. But uh, uh, once I got my eyes swole, <laughs> my, my mother said that was it. She said, no more, no more. But I knew I could make people laugh, you know, because I was always in school clowning and around my friends, you know, I would grab their attention in the streets and they would crowd around and just listen to me tell jokes and oh, wow. things like that. So that was my avenue, you know, to getting into comedy. And when I uh, finally told my mother that that was something that I had a made up mind that I wanted to do, she said, well, you know, that's a very hard field, you know, that you, you're trying to go into. Uh, I don't know. I said, well, you know, mama, either I make it in comedy or I don't make it at all, hmm. you know? So I kind of gave myself no options. So everything I put into comedy, I put in, it was, it was to, to push forward, to, to, to succeed. And uh, that's what I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> I gotta be real. Hosting oh, Deaf Comedy bad. Jam may have given Lawrence control on stage, <laughs> but his first yeah, taste of real power came when he signed with Fox for his own sitcom. I want a gold pool, stick the speed boat, all that. Martin uh -huh. went on to become one of the yeah, yeah. highest rated shows for the network. <laughs> when did it go from pushing forward to make sure you succeeded to pushing forward to make sure you brought people with you? Uh, when I found out I had the power. You know, when I found out I had the power and I, you know, got my own show and I, I was able to put people in certain positions, qualified people and qualified black people, you know, um, I knew I had the power then. Was it really the green light for your own show or did you recognize that power before that? Uh, I didn't recognize the power before that. It was, it was dur uh, during the Martin show, you know, the, while we were going through it. You know, with things I had to speak up for and uh, people, you know, um, um, employees getting their pay and things like that, wanting to bring them back when the network didn't want, want to hire, hire some of them back and things like that for, for money reasons or whatever. I fought for all those things to have the same people and to get them their money and things like that because they were qualified and they were good. Your television show was so groundbreaking for so many different reasons. And I was explaining to my producer, one of the things that was irritating me when I was doing my research for this interview mm -hmm. was how a lot of people were describing it as a cult classic. Martin's a <laughs> cult classic. And I'm like, he had Biggie. <laughs> and if you don't know, now you know. He had Richard Fryer. <laughs> 
<laughs> How is that a cult? He had icons on this show. Right, right, right. Do you hear people refer to your show as a cult classic? And if so, no, I like, never heard that. Okay. I never heard that. I, I, it's just I, I am as it's a classic, and they love it, and it's still running. They just they enjoy it and everything. I never heard a cult classic. No. Who's your favorite character that you portrayed in Martin? My favorite character that I portrayed, like Shanene. Shanene. Shanene Jenkins. Shanene Jenkins. Oh my goodness! If it isn't Little Miss Attitude. Why? Attitude. Black young woman with attitude. She's my sisters. She's my nieces, and she don't take no shit. <laughs> Excuse me. She don't take no stuff. <laughs> Do you think a Shanene Jenkins? will be embraced in the same way today as she was in the early 90s, mid-90s? Mm. That sounds like an interesting idea. Let me think about that for a moment. I think so. I think so. Because of her strength, her boldness, uh, standing up for what she believes in, you know, um, you know I'm a lady, you know, <laughs> stand, 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 you know, just just to the fullest, she represents it, you know, just in her own way, in her own style, you know, and I love that about her. Everyone's asking for a reboot. <laughs> I'm in your face. I'm asking for a reboot. Well, <laughs> Is that a conversation? No, it, it, it's really not because it, we could, we, we call it lightning in a bottle. It's like uh, Tommy Ford's not here. It just wouldn't, it just wouldn't be the same. It just... I, we, we, we couldn't do it again, you know, um, we wouldn't get catch that same magic, you know, so it's best le left alone. Um, we got some closure, you know, uh, on the reunion and uh, to get the cast back together and that was just great. A lot of things have changed in this country mm -hmm. since then. Yes. And, you know, not just in terms of the culture or in terms of politics, mm -hmm. but in terms of what we laugh at mm -hmm. and what we get permission to laugh at. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how comedy has changed from when Martin was first starting to what you're recognizing and seeing today? Well, I think people are a lot more sensitive today. They take comedy way too serious. You know, um, you, you gotta remember comedy is an outlet. It, comedy heals, you know, sickness and, and things. And comedy is, is what we all need in our lives, and I think uh, some people take certain jokes and certain things so serious and that they forget the laughter and the humor in it all and what it's meant to do and do for you and endorphins and all that stuff is supposed to relief and, relief and that you, you're supposed to give off. And, and I just think you have to have it in your life because on the other side of pain is comedy. You know, so I don't know. Uh, I, I believe in let, letting uh, comedians do what they do. You know, I mean, either you like them or you don't. You have your own your, your own opinion. You don't have to watch them if you don't. You have that choice. Uh, but I, I believe uh, comedians, you know, that's what we do. We should have the freedom to express ourselves in a humorous way. Do you think there's a different sort of responsibility or expectations for a black comedian versus a different counterpart? Uh, probably in the sense of we've been through so much for the culture. I mean, we've been through so much, you know, a civil rights uh, movement, you know, voting rights, everything, and uh, police brutality, and just um, so many things that black people have been through, and the comedians that that represent are the culture, you know, we represent the culture from our pain and everything that we've been through. And so we have a lot of laughter there. So the Red Fox, the Richard Pryors, you know, uh, Flip Wilsons, all these guys have paved the way for us, you know, to, to do our thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all because of the freedom of laughter. Consider, you know, certain jokes now, particularly like right. Like the controversies that Dave Chappelle, for instance, mm. went through, and some of the things he was trying to say about culture mm. getting gobbled up in the controversy of how he said it. Mm. You mm. know, back in the day, it felt as if someone like a Richard Pryor could have said that. Yeah. And, and we would have gotten it well. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I just think people are a lot more sensitive. I just think uh, they're not looking at it, he's just being humorous. I mean, right or wrong, you know, comedy is comedy, you know. Um, but you got you got to find a joy in it. You got and you got to let people be be free, uh, just as you want them to allow you to express yourself and be free. You have to let a comedian be free and do his thing, whether whether you like him or not. 
you know. And like I said, if you don't like them, you don't have to watch them. Who's your GOAT? My GOAT? Yeah, your comedic GOAT. <laughs> Where I know LeBron is your basketball GOAT. Richard Pryor. <laughs> Richard Pryor is my comedic GOAT. And right after Richard Pryor is Eddie Murphy. And where are you in that list? I don't rate my, I let the, I let the fans do all that. I thank <laughs> the fans for wherever they put me, just for the love they give me and show me everywhere I go. So, um, you know, if they want to label me, you know, as one of the goals, I'll take that. I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are too, though. <laughs> when we think about GOAT, it's usually through the framework of sports, right? Yes, and that's yes. easily quantifiable. You talk about the stats, championships, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. How do you quantify GOAT when it comes to comedy? Um, I think being, being a triple threat, uh, you know, um, which uh, is be, what stand up, stand up movies, TV, okay, um, and being at the top of your game in all of those at all three levels, and uh, even being a quadruple threat, just if other things you could do, radio and just commercials and things like that. So. I think having the ability to do all those things and be at the top of the game in it, I think uh, that's what, what I would consider somebody as the GOAT. Lawrence has appeared, starred, or executive produced in almost 30 films. Bad Boys, Bad Boys, what, what you gonna, gonna do? The Bad Boys franchise starring opposite Will Smith is one of the most popular worldwide. So what films did he enjoy the most? What is your favorite character in terms of film? And before you answer, mm. I want to tell you, I know we talked a lot about bad boys off camera. Yes. My favorite role that you ever did was life. A lot of people say that, yeah. Why do you think we say that? Maybe because of the drama I, per I performed in it with Eddie. I, you know, Eddie, when Eddie would be, be on the comedy, I would take the drama side. We like Laurel Hardy, so, so to speak. So, you know, I, I, that's what I think. I don't know, you know. Yeah. So what is your favorite role in film? My favorite role? Wow. I got to tell you, roles like I had in Blue Streak. I plan to fight crime. And national security. Ma'am, you may reprocure your vehicle. was some of my favorite because I had, I had get, I, I've been given the rope to do anything I want to do. Just anything with the characters I want to do. And I had fun with them. I was getting paid the most money I, I had ever been paid. <laughs> and I was having fun with these characters. And so what you see on screen is, is me really having fun and getting into to the role. So even though life and all those were fun characters for me to play and everything, even bad boys and things like that, but I have to say Blue Streak, uh, um, um, National Security, who are two of my favorite. Coming up, how Lawrence prepares for his live performances, his thoughts about Richard Pryor, and what he learned from Eddie Murphy when it comes to acting. Did you have any formal training at all? I had a, a, a improv class because I saw that Eddie Murphy had took one or something in New York, and I took the class and for, for a couple sessions, and I was in a traveling theater music group. And Wait, what? A traveling uh, theater music group. Okay. You know, where we did theater, but it was music. And, uh, you know, I remember my teacher, Ersky, his name is Ersky. Uh, he, he told me never ever be afraid to be silly, be crazy. And so I, that stuck with me. And I, I think all through what you see through my comedy, when you see me do things that you go, oh man, what is he doing? Or whatever. That's me not being afraid to go there. Did you sing? Yeah. Can you sing? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you were a chorus singer? <laughs> but I was, I was trying to do anything to get in the business. <laughs> what do you say is the biggest difference for you as a performer between stand-up, television, and film? What's the biggest difference? Yeah, in terms of the way that you approach it, in terms of your preparation. Well, stand-up, I approach it, I take it very serious, because stand-up's not no joke. I mean, it, whether you're in front of 10 people or you're in front of 10,000 people, I mean, 
they all uh, on your every word, and uh, you gotta bring them something. You gotta, you gotta be talking about something. You gotta make them laugh, and so, you know. And to get ready for that, I, I train like I, I'm training for a fight or something. You know, I jog, I exercise, and everything because I have to have energy on stage to walk and back and forth and run the st on the stage. And so I take that very serious. I take uh, movies very serious. I study, I study them ahead of time, you know. Um, so when I get uh, on the set, I'm not fumbling around with the words or trying to constantly remember and things like that. I'm prepared. And I do the same thing for TV. I just prepare myself and I study, I study hard. You've done several movies with Eddie Murphy. What is his process like? His process, he's very focused, very serious. He don't play around. One of the top professionals you're ever gonna work with. And he, he's a team player and uh, he gets the job done. And Eddie is the reason, along with Richard Pryor, is the reason why I do comedy. <laughs> I blame you for everything, Ray. Those two, you know, Eddie took it to rock star status. So I was like, wow, I had never seen that. And uh, I said, wow, that's my man, Eddie Murphy. Let's bring both of them down for a second. Mm. Because in my mind's eye, they're both goats, mm -hmm. but they're goats for two very different reasons. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious as to, for you, what attracted you to Richard Pryor, and mm -hmm. then what attracted you to Eddie, besides the rock star status? Well, with Richard Pryor was his truth. You know, how honest he was with his comedy, uh, how hilarious he was, how he can go into characters in, in stand-up and make you believe you're in the woods and things like that, and just the ultimate stand-up professional. I mean, it doesn't get no better than live in concert. And as far as Eddie Murphy, just like you said, rock star status. I mean, Eddie made it look good with the red suits, with the purple. His comedy was just funny and original. Eddie just, uh, did it, just does it and did it top notch. We return to the topic of black television shows. Look, I want a classy show. Book the rapping chihuahuas. Get them down here, OK? and how black relationships and families weren't always portrayed in the best possible light. He says it's something we didn't have for years. Do you think we have it now? When you look I at- I do, when you look at blackish, I think genius show. I'm going to need my family to be black. Not blackish, but black. When you look at that and the family aspect and the, the way they put that show together, excellent, excellent. Do you think Hollywood or, or content that's being produced now is representing that enough to the point in which it feels normalized? Not yet. We need more. I mean, we, we're doing good. You know, we have some things breaking through and things like that, but uh, just some ain't enough for us. I mean, we, we, we long overdue for plenty of things, <laughs> plenty True. of things. Martin and Gina is one of my favorite couples. Mm -hmm. What was one of your favorite couples on television or film? my favorite couples, Lucy and Ricky. Lucille Ball, Ricky Ricardo, uh, Honeymooners, and uh, moving on up. What was that show? Jefferson's. Jefferson's, Jefferson's, yeah. We got us a maid, Wheezy, we got us a maid! What was it about those couples that... Because they, they seem real, you know, they, they fought and everything else, but they loved hard, you know, they, and they stayed together. You know, that's what I loved about it. You know? How much of that do you want to see continue applied to the work that you do? That message of sticking it out through thick or thin? Because that's what it's about, you know? That's what life is about, you know? Um, the greatest thing we have in life is love, and that's God, you know? And uh, if, if, you, if, if, if you just stay on that note, you, you'll, be, you'll, you'll be where you want to be. You'll get what you want to get. You'll be happy is where, where you want to be, I'm sure. You miss the stage? Yeah, I do when I'm not on it. I, I, I miss it, but I don't take it for granted. That's why I don't rush back to it, you know? I love everybody do their thing. Dave and Chris, everybody doing their thing. I love it, and uh, um, I, I, you know, I just wait for my time, you know? Um, I don't really worry about what everybody else is doing. I just wait to see when God lets me know when it's time for me to go back out and, and uh, bring some, some laughter to the world. What subject matter 
given everything that's occurred since the last time you had a special mm -hmm. that you really are looking forward to tackling? Or not even looking forward to, just know you need to. Oh, uh, wow. That's, that's not an easy question. Uh. I don't know. I, I think I can't get out of way. I, I think you would have to see the concert to know what, it, what I've come up with. Because I, I have to be very smart about it, you know, very smart about it. You know, because we are in a time of people are more sensitive and things like that. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to change who I am and the way I do things. But, you know, I am going to respect the fact that people do have feelings and, and things like that. And, and uh, if I could do something a, di a different way and get the same effect that, that doesn't hurt, then I could do it that way. That's what I've come to learn. When I was young, I would just go for it. I just did it my way. But as I got older, I learned to, you know, respect it a little more. Are there any jokes or skits that, looking back on, you go, <sighs> No, not not really. No, not really. I, 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 it's some stuff I talked about. I mean, because I talked about sex, everything, and relationships, everything. I, you name it. And I, I, I don't really cringe because that was the freedom that I wanted. You know, I just know now that I'm older, certain things I don't have. I don't have to go there to get the same result. You know, so, so. But I want to still be funny. We're not just black, we're cops too. We'll pull ourselves over later. <laughs> That's one of the things I loved about Bad Boys 3 was you did embrace getting older. Mm. You talked about it. We start off with you becoming a grandfather. Mm. What can we expect for Bad Boy 4 now that it's announced? Something good for <laughs> Something good for I, I can't give it away. Oh, come on. Jer Jerry would not get on me for giving this away. <laughs> but you, you're going to want to see this one. You know, I think one of the reasons why you're so loved, and not just in the black community, but globally, but when it comes to blackness, for me, there was always such a true authenticity that you were never willing to sacrifice. Right. And you're going to be you, and that's your experience growing up as a black man. Mm -hmm. Do you feel as if, given all the streaming opportunities and the way that the industry is today, mm -hmm. that there's enough in which we can have that authenticity or is there still some holding back because we aren't quite sure if America's ready for it's all it, of it? It's, it? it's still some holding back, but we can have that authenticity because if you stand true to your work, you know, if, if they're telling you, trying to hold you back, you have to fight against that. You have to tell them, nah, this is what I believe. This, this is why I'm doing this. This is why this is going to work. And y'all going to have to trust me on this. And so y'all, you know, whoever's trying to hold you back, oh, well, you're going to have to meet some kind of common ground. Else it's, it's not going to get done or the result, you're not going to get the results you want. Favorite joke you've heard recently? Joke? Yeah. <laughs> what was the funny joke I heard? I heard a joke, uh, somebody said some of these women looking for their husband out here, but they can't, they can't find a new husband because they can't get through them eyelashes. They can't see through <laughs> long ass eyelashes. <laughs> <laughs> they can't see them. <laughs> if you were to be able to reboot Martin or have your own show again, <clears throat> do you want a live studio audience again? I would love that. What, why? Because their energy. They make the show. You know, they, they know what's funny and what's not. And uh, they yeah and they it, you know, so from just by their energy. If, you, if it's not something that's not going well, you're going to feel it. Because they, they're sitting there quiet. But if it's funny and it's good, you're going to feel their energy. You know, they, they're going to laugh. They're going to stomp. They're going to woo, 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 woo. You know, they're going to do something. So great, great. When it's all said and done, mm -hmm. and someone's doing a documentary on your life, yes. what is the one aspect of who you are as a performer that you want to make sure is mentioned? Who I am as a performer, my, my belief in God. Because every, ever since I was young, I had a strong belief in God through my mother um, instilling that in us. And um, I was uh, about baptized in a uh, holiness church with my best friends and uh so we've always been in the god and everything i've done i've always prayed and i've always asked for guidance 
I just want to live a life of love and peace and want everybody else to feel that same way, you know? Amen, you know? brother. Amen. You know?